welcome to the uh, continuing winemaker series, series here at the Wine Milk Club. Very excited to have, heading into the holidays, Chris Forbes here from, uh, well, what's the parent company's name? The Floodgate Partnership. The Floodgate Partnership, which is, uh, hosts uh, three brands of port from Portugal. It's Fla Taylor Floodgate, easy for you to say, Fonseca, and Croft. And so we're going to taste through a couple of really fun, fun wines from that part of town. But a little history about what you're doing here. What, how did you end up in the port business? Obviously, from your accent, you're not Portuguese. That's right. Yeah, British, born in the north of England by uh, by birth to uh, a father that uh, made his money from the textile industry and a mother that was a classically trained French chef. Really? So there was always good food and good wine oh, in, the, uh, wow. in the house. And uh, until I moved over to Portugal, which was in 2003, I was uh, sadly working in the uh, world of investment banks, and it was time to get out of that. Really? So uh, it was time to follow a passion for something which I really uh, loved, which was always wine. And uh, my wife is actually Portuguese. She's from the city of Porto, so it seemed like the sensible wow. place to move to. <laughs> and as we live in the home of where these incredible wines have made, I, uh, I found myself uh, working for this incredible house. And uh, I now travel extensively here to the, uh, the United States. I spend a good four, four and a half months here every year. Wow. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's great to be here in, uh, in LA and hopefully uh, you know, showing you guys these wines and talking a little bit more about them. Love it. A long time to be across the pond. Yes, right? exactly. So how long did it take, this is off the subject, how long did it take you to learn Portuguese where it's just... Um, so I spoke um, other foreign languages before I, uh, I came over to oh, Portugal. Yeah, okay, yeah, so so I, I was schooled in Paris, um, grew really? up in Hong Kong, Shanghai and Beijing. Um, so I spent a lot of time moving uh, moving around and I had a hell of a good teacher and a, and a Portuguese wife and three children who I need to know what they're saying about me so I had to learn the language. Well, so that means French, Portuguese, Spanish, Spanish, yeah. uh, Mandarin, and, Cantonese? Uh, no, can swear very well in those languages. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, get, I got sworn at in Arabic. So right, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. So we have an uh, interesting selection. So the, tell me the difference between Fladgate, Taylor Fladgate, Croft, and Fonseca. They're separate properties, separate yep. mine makers. Separate, so separate properties, but um, we are owned by, uh, by three families. Um, but the main main family that owns the the uh, the, uh, the company is a com is a family called the the Robertsons. Um, so we our head winemaker is a guy called David Gimenez. He's sixth generation Fonseca, wow. fifth generation winemaker. Um, these houses, particularly Taylor Flagate, we're celebrating our 325th anniversary this year. So founded in 1692, um, and has never left family ownership in those entire wow. 325 years. Uh, Croft is uh, was founded in 1588. So any historians out there, that's the year of the Spanish Armada. So uh, that's been around for a while. And then the baby is Fonseca, which was founded in 1815. Just young, the young and young, yeah, the young right. one in the in the stable, exactly. So, Very interesting. So yeah, three distinctive house uh, styles: um, head winemaker, and then individual winemakers that uh, help David Gimenez in the process of making these wines and putting these lots together. So in general, uh, this is we'll tell the folks what port is. Port is wine where the fermentation has been arrested, but Correct. its purpose was to make long journeys on the boats. To exactly, yeah. So uh, when the English were fighting with the with the French, yet again, uh, we needed to try and find an alternative source for our wines, which was historically from Bordeaux. Um, but there's been always a long uh, free trade agreement between England and Portugal. So we went over to Portugal and tried to find some table wines to be able to ship back. The problem was that the first wines we found, which were from the area of Viana do Costello, which is north of the city of Porto, which nowadays is very famous for the making of Vigna Verde, um, whites and reds. By the time that those wines were shipped back, they arrived pretty much in Port shot, Condor. Right. Exactly, totally shot. So we needed to find somewhere else further afield, and we discovered the Dora Valley, where there had already been vines put in the ground by the Romans uh, centuries before us. But by the time those wines were actually made, they were much bigger, more robust, and by the time they were shipped back and arrived to the UK, they arrived in much better condition. It was at that stage that the addition of brandy started to uh, to take place, and what that helped do was stabilise the wines, mm -hmm. um, so that they arrived in good condition, but very importantly, it appealed to the English palate at the time, because the other wine that was being drunk by the English was German hock, so that medium sweet white wine, right, so that right. sweetness um, really appealed to the, um, to the, to well, the UK. that's interesting, but so the, the addition of brandy occurred at that point as well during fermentation, not just adding it to the finished product to try yeah. and stabilize it. So the process of actually everybody fortifying their wines um, really started to occur in the late 1790s, early 1800s, um, where 
we, as you, uh, as you mentioned, we start our fermentation. Our fermentation period is really short. So it only takes place for about two and a half to three days. And we stop or we arrest our fermentation by the addition of grape spirit, 77% proof grape spirit. Oh, grape spirit. And when that grape spirit comes into contact with the fermenting <coughs> wine, fermentation stops. So two things, you get higher alcohol, so about 20% alcohol in, in, in most ports but also you get that sweetness because of the amount of residual sugars that we have left in the wine. So th this is not the glass you should be pouring port in at your Christmas or Thanksgiving day. This is all I have Although upstairs. It's a good <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good glass. We want to use a portable glass or a port Yeah, or a, or a well-proportioned white wine glass. <laughs> right, I mean, a yeah. lot of people would pour port into, you know, a cordial glass or in some cases, mm -hmm. worst cases, even a shot glass. So um, where you're not going to get any of those aromatic qualities from the wine. So a well-proportioned white wine glass would be, it would be great to serve port in. I will say that this wine up here does deserve the, the aromatic, you know, uh, experience because it's, it's quite dramatic. So tell us about this Croft Tawny. So Croft uh, Reserve Tawny. So a Tawny Port is a wine which has been aged in small wooden casks, casks which are 550 to 680 litres in size. So what you get is a lot of wood contact and a lot of air contact. And that process of evaporation which takes place at about 2% per year for the first 20 years of these wines. So as opposed to having a lot of those ruby style characters, a lot of that primary fruit, in a tawny port, what you're going to see are those lovely dried fruits, nutty, raisiny characteristics. Lovely served chilled as well, so don't feel uh, that you can't put it into, uh, into the refrigerator and serve it from the refrigerator. So nicely served chilled, gives you a different moment of consumption, particularly when it's 100 degrees outside, um, <laughs> which isn't generally when we think about no. drinking port. Oh. Um, and tawny ports are also good because of the way that they've been aged, that you can actually leave them open for quite a bit longer. So you can leave this open very happily for a good two to three months and it will maintain all of that freshness for you and so i sort of went out of order and i no, not not a problem when the ruby here but the just the the tawny yeah is good that's, that's the almonds and the stilton exactly. cheese so and precisely the dried, dried fruits, fruits nutty right. raisiny figgy characteristics and the reserve tawny tells you that that wine is has an average age of seven years of age mm. flipping back into the uh into the uh, into, into the, the bin, ruby into the ruby so this is a reserve ruby so all ruby ports arranged in very large wooden vats. So vats which can be anything in our case from about 20,000 liters in size to 100,000 liters in size. So incredibly large surface areas. So very little air contact, very slow gentle aging of these wines. So you maintain all of those primary fruit flavors. So here, a lot of lovely woodland fruit, black currants, brambly, um, cassis flavors in the wine. Tannins are a little bit more pronounced. And when you're pairing it, think of things about chocolate-based desserts, uh, flourless chocolate mm -hmm. cakes, cheeses, farmhouse cheddars um, would go really well with, uh, with something like a reserve ruby port. And if you like to make your cocktails, then you could think about using this in something like a, a Manhattan and using it as a modifier. So replacing that wow. sweet vermouth component, um, Bin 27 would work really well for that as well. I'm and a Manhattan guy and I make pretty good, yeah. pretty good Manhattan, so, so I do so, try this. And that's where we're getting a, a lot of people to think that they can use port at different times, not right. just thinking that it can be holiday season and Christmas, but actually use it all year round. So you live here in a country with an incredibly rich cocktail culture, so <laughs> why not use uh, Why port not do it? I'm gonna try that because uh, works well. I consider myself a Manhattan aficionado. <laughs> So this is the 10 year. Yeah, so the, is, yeah. what does that mean? So the 10 years is telling you that the average age of the wines here is 10 years of age. So these wines, again, have been aged in those small wooden casks, but you'll see even more uh, evolution in, the, in this wine. So lovely red fruit, but really starting to see these lovely um, almond marzipan wow. uh, characteristics start to come through and a lovely little bit of, uh, of citrus. And don't just think about cheeses, think about um, things like pumpkin pies, um, almond tarts, creme yes. brulees would yes. be wonderful with something yes. like this. And if you really want to mix it up, have it at the beginning of your meal with something like pâtés and terrines, because you've got this lovely acidity that would cut through the fattiness That's in amazing. those pâtés and terrines as well. That is a great idea. Yeah. So it can be done with savoury as well as sweet.